Yeah. Well, overall, the biggest thing is gonna be compliance, right? So if you're like, I can't do it with meals, I'll, have to, I'll throw up, I'll, what, I, then I don't have a choice, we gotta do it between meals, right? But if you, know, you gave me full control and you're like, I can do whatever you want, then I would just have you do a glass of milk with each meal daily, and then I would gradually increase that. That's your progression up, right? And we're titrating to effect until you start gaining weight. And once you're gaining weight, you don't need to keep increasing the milk until you stop gaining weight, right? And at some point you're like, well, listen, no more milk, no me gusta, I can't do it. I'm like, peanut butter, add peanut butter, right? And you're doing a similar sort of deal. Uh, this happened to me in college, so I went into college at 165 pounds, uh, very small, and I, uh, once I started training, I went up to 230, and uh, that was a fun like year, year and a half sort of deal. But I was eating, I mean, an uncomfortable amount of food, so I, I've definitely been there before as well. My favorite go-to is peanut butter and jelly. Because you just do three or four peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at once, protein shake, good to go. Plus it's college, you know, super cheap. But for you, since you're a fancy pathologist, you're super rich, um, <laughs> you can get like the you know organic, non you know fair trade milk, and you can t <laughs> titrate that up. But that, that's that's how I would do that. Incorporate the gallon of milk a day, provided you're not training, changing your diet otherwise, right? Because yeah, so I think I would pick one thing and then just do that. So let's say your diet baseline per day is four meals per day. You have good protein source, good carb source, and decent fat source per meal. All right, so that's your baseline. I would add a cup of milk each meal, all right? And if your weight's starting to go up, that's cool. You don't need more milk. It's got a plateau, and then you add more milk. Now it's two cups per meal, all right? At some point, you're gonna be like, I I can't do it, more, no more milk. And then I think the easiest thing is you, it's gonna be like a peanut butter type of situation. Super calorie dense. Yeah. yeah. You know there's a new pediatric nut butter out for like malnourished? It's, it, it's like, it's, it's either funny butter or something like that, but it's like double calorie peanut butter. Wow. Sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so is that your go-to for gaining weight though? Peanut butter? Milk? milk. I mean, I, I have no allegiance to milk. Right, I think it's it's portable, it's cheap, good protein source, right, and you can find it anywhere. Yeah, and if you like milk, it's fine. The worst thing that somebody can do is say, "I drink, I'm drinking no milk right now. I'm an adult male, all right," and then but I'm gonna start a gallon of milk tomorrow. <laughs> like every toilet that you pass is gonna hate you. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, it titrate it up, right? You're trying to titrate to effect till you gain weight, and once the scale starts moving, you don't need more than that until it stops moving, and then you add more. Right, so the gallon of milk a day thing, I wouldn't just apply that initially. Just titrate to effect. Milk's fine. You can also blend things into milk. Nope. Nope, can't. Not doing the program. <laughs> nope, that's 98% rule. Yeah. Not doing the program. Because they're, I mean, I've worked with people who are, you know, cachectic and they are <laughs> completely unwilling to chew sufficient food to gain weight. It's like, yeah, I can have you. I mean, I had a guy who was literally eating like an egg and a half cup of rice for a meal, oh, and yeah. then his dinner was like some steamed vegetables, like, that's it. Yeah. And so, you know, he's like, I wanna do milk, but he couldn't get, I mean, the gallon of milk was like the size of his torso, like he couldn't drink that much anyway. So I said, you're gonna have to start blending some higher calorie dense foods in, into, and, and then liquid is easy, you know, liquid calories easier to drink than chewing a whole bunch of food. So we could put some peanut butter into the milk and Oops. ice cream into the milk and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, melted ice cream is great. Yeah. yeah. What about eggs for losing Yeah, great. Yeah, I would never, I wouldn't. What's that? Like, I mean, whole eggs would take to get that three gram So, yeah, I don't remember the exact amount offhand. I think if you get 20 grams of protein from the egg, which is like three and a half eggs, three and a quarter eggs, you're hitting that threshold. I don't remember the specific yeah. leucine content per egg. Like egg if, just if you do the yolk, then you get what, four, three and a half grams of protein per egg white. So then you just need more. So six egg whites makes the, makes the deal. Plus, don't forget the leucine contribution from the other components of the meal, right? If you have cheese on that, if you have oats, all has a little bit of leucine. So the summative leucine value may, in fact, exceed that. Yeah, also Taco Bell is really good. Just, you're, well, in, you're in San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't say that here. Oh, where I come from, <laughs> Taco Bell's a delicacy. Yeah, we don't do. That. You don't do Taco Bell? No. You know you have Jack in the Box though. 
Next question. <laughs> <laughs> probably most people are getting the sense that it's changed. That would be fair. You know, previously I thought it, you know, from a from a analysis standpoint that if you spiked muscle protein synthesis more times per day and you gave people more leucine per day on average, they'd probably retain more muscle mass. We don't have really any evidence to suggest that that's true and you know, I think the more and more I read about it, the less and less convinced I am that BCAAs are super useful from a muscle protein synthesis standpoint. Uh, in the in the context of a protein rich diet, all right. So if you're eating a protein rich diet, I think the biggest benefit potentially from BCAAs would be your performance in the gym. If you took them directly before and after, and I think that you know is uh, from a hydration standpoint is a thing. Um, from a mental uh, fatigue standpoint is certainly a thing. Um, but otherwise, for muscle protein or like uh, muscle retention. I probably wouldn't do it. Yeah, unless you're only eating like 80 grams or 70 grams of protein a day. Nah, you good? Yeah. yeah, I remember he said he established step one as setting your protein. Once you calculate your, once you have your caloric needs for the day, setting your protein. And if you're hitting that sufficient protein amount, then eh. yeah. Notice, notice that it's okay to change your mind on stuff when presented new or consistent information. Yeah, so I probably, you know, at that point, um, their protein intake is going to be pretty low. You know, usually at that point they start looking at, you know, what is the uh, RDA for, I think for an adult female, it's like 46 grams a day, an adult male, it's like 60 grams a day or something like that. So that's their like dietary protein intake. And then on top of that, I would add a scoop of BCAAs every meal. Yeah, and because for, and, could, for, and for PKU it doesn't matter because none of the base, none of the BCAAs that you would be supplementing are phenylalanine. Correct. So yeah, you would just make sure that your protein isn't spiked with a sh ton of phenylalanine. That'd be yeah. weird. Well, so that they thing. so usually they spike. Usually protein manufacturers will spike with glycine, glycine. taurine, creatine. Yeah. Those are the big ones, or glutamine. So these are effectively non, I wouldn't say they're non-useful amino acids, but they're non-essential amino acids and they're way cheaper than the BCAAs and they up the, nit the nitrogen content of the actual protein. So you'll see on a label, 30 grams of protein per serving. <laughs> Meanwhile, the leucine content is low, right? But the glycine content is super, super high. So the average glycine content for a normal sco scoop of good uh, whey protein is in the hundreds, 100s. Okay, so if you see glycine in the thousands, you have just purchased a protein spiked protein supplement. If you see creatine included in your protein supplement, you have just bought a protein spiked protein supplement. If you see glutamine in your protein supplement, you have just purchased a protein spiked supplement. It doesn't mean that it's bad or it's not useful, it just means that you're supporting an industry that's crooked, it's baseline, and there are other products that you could purchase <laughs> support the cause. Yeah. Is it still preferable to maybe have a protein shake before working out? So what, what time from you wake up to the time you eat breakfast? What are those times? How, um, how long? Probably about maybe two hours. So what I would do is on the way into the gym, I would have one scoop of whey protein, uh, like one scoop of one cup of oats or something like that and coffee, slam that down, then train, and then eat three hours after that thing. That's what I would do. So your breakfast delayed 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. One cup of raw oats. So if it's instant, if it's instant oats, so, you, so here if you want something tasty, so <laughs> you do one scoop of whey, one cup of oats, mix it with milk or water, let it sit overnight. Just overnight oats. Yep. Yeah. And then put it in a shaker, and then slam it. If you want some instant coffee in there, there you go. Yeah. Yep. That's what I do. Yep. Yeah. So what do you what do you all recommend? Yeah. So the degree is important insofar as it teaches you how to think and how to read. And so I would suggest that you use those skills uh, and try to learn how to read the literature and think. Uh, you sound like you have already, I might be biased, but you sound like you've already done a good job of finding some credible sources of information by being here this weekend. Uh, I would suggest that you find other people like us, because there are other people like us out there that are putting out good information like that. And they can direct you to good sources. And then my little pet project that I'm working on among 30 others is to actually generate kind of a 
uh, recommended reading list uh, that we'll, people will put up on the Barbell Medicine website. It'll include uh, it'll include books, but primarily it'll include uh, published literature. On a lot of it is on the topics that we discussed this weekend, um, among other things. So I'm working on that right now, and I hope that'll be helpful to, to people who are looking for that. Yeah. So, so NASM would be a waste of your time and money because it's expensive enough to that to be the barrier for you. But if you're going to PT school, you should have the ACSM HFS. The health and fitness specialist or, or similar. Right. You could have you be CSCS yeah, either. Yeah. yeah, so effectively you've already paid for that, you can do it. Any additional like training based certification is unlikely to sway judgment. So if you intern a strength coach or an athletic trainer sort of situation, then that's good experience to have for for the, the people who are gonna be looking over your uh, application. And I think that you should write stuff. If you you know want to submit articles to different, various different places to get published or start your own blog, like people look very highly upon like self starters who are researching stuff. That stuff that stuff differentiates you from the other undergrads who are applying to PT school who may or may not have CSCS. See what I'm saying? Like because everybody, it's easy to go get a, a cert, hard to write you know 50 articles. You know, you're, and you're and then they would ask, well, why did you write so many articles? You're like, because I want to help people. And I'll put this information out there, and I wanted to learn. So this made me do that.